So, welcome to the chapter 7 implementing strategy control and structure. So, if you look at about the rational model we discuss uh, in the classroom up to now, we have discussed uh, few uh, stages of the model. So, first of all, look at about vision, missions values, goals, objectives, targets, then we look at about our environment, position analysis, position analysis that were mainly look at about the internal environment, then environmental analysis that look at about the external environment. Then we combine the result to the corporate appraisal. Then we look at about the strategic options, option and strategic choice, strategic choice here we try to identify the appropriate strategy, here we uh, try to uh, evaluate them and identify the best strategy for the organization. Now, the next one is strategy implementations, strategy implementations and then uh, the final one is actually strategic control, strategy control, disconnect here again, right, if you remember the model. Uh, so, I am moving to uh, discuss strategy implementations and along with that I will uh, discuss strategy control also with you. So, first of all, uh, we will look at about the content of the chapter number 7. So, first of all, uh, we will discuss uh, implementing strategy, we will discuss uh, how uh, we can implement the strategy and what are the uh, concern on that. Then uh, topic number 2 and 3 uh, cover about that controlling part. So, we look at our monitoring strategic performance and the strategic control. Then, uh, so we will uh, discuss about different type of structures we have to consider when you implement the strategy that is topic number 4 cover organization configuration and structure. In topic number 5, uh, look at about different uh, strategic coordinative we have choosing a structure under that. Topic number 6. We look at about the modern development in uh, organizational structure, what are the, the new uh, structural option we have. Then uh, topic number 7, we will look at about the relationship between strategy and structure. Then topic number 8, we will look at about uh, the strategic drip. Right. So, when you are implementing the strategy, uh, so what are the main considerations? It is uh, it not an easy task, lot to be done. For an example, uh, so, so many uh, things that we have to arrange, employees, we have to acquire some resources, then we have to communicate with different parties, right. So, what are the uh, things uh, we have to consider under the planning stage of the implementing strategy? There are few concerns here, look at the concern area. 
the planning stage of an implementation process is essential as it help to. So, normally uh, the planning stage in implementation help for few things one is communicate what has to be done when and by whom. So, it tell what we want to do under the study implementations at what time we have to do at the same time who will do that. Then at the same time it encourage forward thinking at the same time uh, right it uh, provide the measure of success. So, we identify what type of uh, indicators we had used to measure the success then make clear the commitment of time resources and money required for the implementation process. So, we have to identify at what time uh, uh, we need what particular resources through this particular plan uh, we can uh, assign that one for this implementation work. Then identify the specific activities the resource will be used for. We can identify uh, what type of activities we are going to have to use the resources. So, normally uh, we are aware that uh, when you are doing this one uh, we will face some issues also. For an example, uh, we have to communicate with so many uh, people within the organization outside the uh, organizations. Therefore, it is very important to have a proper coordination with these people. Otherwise, uh, uh, there may be some issues in delaying the project work. Right. In the planning stage, uh, we have to uh, develop some detail plan, separate detail plan for certain areas. What are the specific plan we have to do? Uh, prepare. There are few actually. There are seven specific plan we have to prepare. So, what are the uh, plans we have to prepare. First one is implementation manager, then time, quality, resources, contingency, communications, then deliverable or in other words the scope. So, we will look at about uh, each one in detail. First one is the implementation manager. It is very important to understand the responsibilities of the implementation manager within the planning stage. Normally, their primary uh, responsibility is to define the objectives clearly with the board of directors and the communicate uh, them to the rest of the implementation team. So, he has to play an important role here, right. So, he uh, identify what are the objective along with the board of directors and he has to communicate these uh, objective to the implementation team. Therefore, uh, he is having responsibility to get the involvement of the implementation team members in the planning process. Uh, from that, uh, he can get the required commitment and the ownership to the implementation from the members. Right. Then uh, the second element is time, time, time element. So, time plan normally lists all the activities and how long each is planned to take. So, if you have identify uh, normally we identify few activities no. So, in there we can identify uh, time for each activity within the this time plan at that particular time we have to complete the activity. Otherwise the right if you delay one activity right if that is connected with some other activities then whole project uh, implementation will be delay to avoid that one. So, you have to uh, in line with the time target given for each activity. And the next variable is quality. Uh, normally, quality uh, plan include uh, identification of the processes, uh, customers, the key outcome each expect and the acceptance criteria that have been agreed with them. So, you have to identify uh, what type of quality level you have to maintain. For example, from customer point of view, what is the quality uh, level we have to, to give our product to them. Therefore, that is very important aspects. Then another one is uh, resources. 
this plan check peaks and uh, uh, the workload right uh, to ensure the human resource plan is feasible. Here we look at about uh, at what particular time we need resources, at what point we need more resources, at what point we have ideal resources, then accordingly we pre, uh, plan for that. For example, when there is a requirement to get uh, additional resources, we make the arrangement on that. When there is a time period, there are some members uh, have ideal time, we may ask them to go for some other work. <coughs> like that, uh, we will plan here. Then uh, the contingency, this contingency planning uh, include deciding on what additional activities uh, cost and time need to be added to the plan to ensure a reliable budget and the completion dates, right. If something unexpected happen, so how can we deal? Uh, how can uh, we deal with that one will be identify under the contingency plan. It is better to identify a risk uh, register also. With the risk register, we can identify what type of risk we will face. Then uh, we can identify the appropriate strategy to deal with particular risk uh, if that arise. Then communication plan. Communication plan uh, normally identify the key people in the implementation process. They are likely concerned specific information need, form of reporting deadlines and plan method of communication. So, you identify uh, with whom you have to communicate at what time you have to communicate. For example, maybe there are some external suppliers involved, right? their contacts numbers. Uh, so, those all information will be available with this communication plan. Then, uh, Deliverable or scope. In this plan, uh, we will detail exactly what has been agreed as deliverable of the implementations. So, what uh, we are trying to achieve from the plan will be identified here. So, this should be uh, agreed at the beginning. Otherwise, uh, right, there will be some uh, right conflicts within the organization also. Right. Then reporting. It is important to uh, have a reporting information system. We have to set up a, a reporting information system to record and monitor the progress of the implementation against the plan. So, normally at the beginning uh, within that particular system, we have to identify what we are trying to achieve. From time to time, we have to look at about the progress of them. If there are some uh, deviations, so we will take the corrective action also with that. That corrective action should be taken uh, early as possible without any delay. So, if there are any uh, significant uh, delays, result of uh, right uh, some unexpected deviations it is better to communicate that one to the board of directors also. Right. Then uh, we will look at about uh, how uh, we can monitor the strategic performance of the organizations. Yeah, actually, we are looking about this controlling part. Now, how uh, the monitoring work is uh, carried out? Uh, so, normally, what we do is uh, we compare actual performance with the planned performance. So, we do that actual performance is compared with the planned performance. If there are any deviation, what we will do is uh, we will take. Uh, some control measures to rectify the situations. Now, when there is unfavorable deviation, normally we will take corrective action on that. For monitoring purpose, uh, we can use both financial and non-financial indicators. So, later I will explain uh, the example on financial and non-financial indicators. So, this is very important uh, one. 
what is the reason for measuring non financial performance traditionally we use only the financial uh, indicators to measure the performance of the organizational activities but it's really important to use non financial indicators also so if you look at the financial indicators uh, we use indicators like return on investment then roce gross profit ratio net profit ratio earning per share dividend per share net assets per share the financial indicators were used to determine the performance of the organizations based on that we came to a conclusions for an example roc roa uh, earning per share if these ratios have been uh, increased positively then we came to a conclusion that organization has performed really well but we ignore some non financial indicators like customer satisfaction employee satisfactions the quality of the products now why it is important to look at about non financial performance of the organizations there are few reasons we look at about those reasons normally uh, the historical non financial performance uh, is often a guide to the future you can talk about the financial in performance financial indicators connect with the past i uh, look at about the pnl for example it say profit and loss account say for the year ended so we talk about something which happened in the past right therefore financial performance is a measure of what has happened in the past but that will not guarantee will have a better financial performance in the future true no think about your past if you perform well in the past will that will guarantee that you will do the same in the future that will not happen no that is one of the fundamental issue with the financial indicators but if you get a non financial indicators that always give a good guideline for future for an example customer satisfactions now we we can measure customer satisfaction through number of customer complaints if number of customer complaint have been increase in the previous year that indicate customers are not happy with the organizations that will result in fall in sales in future years financial indicators may say right we have done really well profit is there in the year but see now we look at about non financial indicator of, the, of this number of customer complaint that has been increase so that indicate customers are not happy even though this year we have recorded the highest number of sales for example so that will lead uh, for right reduction in sale in the future years so therefore it's very important to use this non financial performance indicators right that will help us to give a uh, right uh, that will help us to come to a conclusion about the future performance of the organizations right there is one element right historical non performance is open guide to the future now i give some example on that another reason for measuring non financial performance is there is an non financial aspect of the strategy also non financial aspect of strategy if you look at the strategy that not only look at about the financial aspect that look at about the non financial aspect also for example strategy may focus on giving the maximum customer satisfactions strategy may look in about giving maximum satisfaction to the employees strategy may be focusing on uh, to conduct business activities without not harm into the environment so see there are non financial objective we have right therefore it is important to check whether we have fulfill this non financial objective we have identify along with the strategy to do that we need to have some non financial indicators like uh, right uh, indicators like number of customer complaint which measure the customer satisfaction right uh, 
uh, employee turnover which measure the employee satisfaction that is another reason uh, why we need non financial indicators very important one from the exam point of right this has been tested few time in the exam. The strategic uh, control now strategic control involve uh, monitoring progress towards strategic objectives and taking control measures when actual performance indicate the strategic target will not be met. Here we look at the long term objective we have in five. So, here we monitor the progress towards strategic objective. Uh, for example, say we have identified a strategic objective of uh, increasing market share up to 25 percent from 20 after 5 year period. So, we will check after 2 years time, we will check uh, what is about the progress. We will say after 2 years time, we should have increased up to 22 percent of the market share. But suppose now uh, it is uh, 21 percent. So, it fall no, uh, the progress is not good. If you uh, move like this in the future. So, we will not be uh, able to achieve the our target of uh, increasing market share up to 25 percent at the end of the fifth year of the plan. So, now we have to take corrective action on that right. So, accordingly we will look at the reason and we will take uh, some corrective measures. Uh, normally, strategy control uh, uh, involve monitoring of both financial and non-financial performance actually the best tool we can use for this purpose is the balance score card. Normally, balance score card cover both the financial and non-financial performance indicators BSC model. So, later we will discuss the balance score card in details. Normally, uh, BSC model uh, try to identify uh, four different perspectives financial perspective, then uh, custom perspective, internal business perspective The learning and innovation perspective. Learning and innovation perspective, but in practice uh, how we conduct the strategic uh, control in relation to each perspective uh, what we do is uh, normally we identify some indicators, some performance indicators are identified right. Uh, for example, in relation to financial perspective, we can look at about the uh, ratio like ROA, ROCE, earning per share, net assets per share. Right. So, practically what we do is normally at the beginning of the year, we uh, set target on each indicator. Then at the end of the year, we measure the actual performance. Then we come to conclusion with the, uh, the relevant uh, financial aspects uh, has been uh, met or not. If not, we will take the corrective action. In relation to uh, this other perspective also, we identify some indicators right. For example, here customer perspective, number of uh, customer complaints, then market share, number of new customers. In relation to these indicators uh, at the beginning of the year normally we will identify some uh, target then at the end of the year they will measure that one based on that they will come to a conclusion about that right. Here also we identify some indicators like uh, wastage ratio, number of defective items. So, we can take uh, number of employee strike, labor turnover, labor absenteeism. So, we will set target on that and at the end of the year we will measure them. Learning and innovation uh, for example, 
number of new product introduced, number of new product introduced, number of process improvement made, number of process improvement made, right. Then uh, research and development expenditure, training cost. So, in relation to these uh, indicators, uh, we will uh, set target and uh, accordingly will measure the performance. Normally, what happens is, uh, right, uh, normally uh, in a strategic plan, uh, we have uh, set target for uh, long term period. No? Say, for example, 5 year strategic plan, we have set the target for 5 year period, right. For example, uh, say market share. Suppose at the percent 20 percent, you want to increase this up to 25 percent. Then within our long term plan in relation to this uh, customers perspective, so market share have been identified uh, as 25 percent at the end of fifth year. But practically what we will do is uh, we uh, divide this plan into small uh, interim plans. So, we divide this uh, long term plan into interim plan. So, strategic plan. Uh, Strategic plan will be divided into a uh, interim plan. We can have uh, five year plans, separate plan. For example, for the year one, in relation to market share, we can have a target of 21 percent, year two, 22 percent, 23, 24, 25. Then at the end of uh, each year, we will uh, monitor uh, this target, we will check whether the target has been achieved or not accordingly the corrective action will be taken. I think it is clear for you how this is uh, happening in practice. Then, uh, so we will look at about uh, the topic number 4, topic number 4 uh, is organization configuration and structure. Now, uh, under the implementations, uh, the one of the important thing we have to look at about the organization structure. So, now we have a proposed strategy. Now, we are trying to implement this proposed strategy within the existing organized structure, right. So, this is the main consideration under the strategy implementations. There are few concerns actually. Normally, uh, there are few views. One is uh, strategy should be in line with the existing structure. Otherwise, you cannot implement the proposed strategy successfully. That is one view we have. Another view is uh, you look at about the structure accordingly you should prepare this strategy right. Two view point actually, two view point one is uh, strategy should follow structure according to the structure you prepare the strategy. Other one is right structure follow strategy to match the strategy right you identify the appropriate stru structure within the organization so therefore it's clear when you look at about this two view point also right structure will play an important role in the implementation part therefore we want to learn about the organization structure in details Right. So, uh, look at the topic number 4, our topic number 4 is uh, organization configuration and structure
So, Johnson uh, and others have identified uh, three main group, three main uh, group uh, of challenges for 21st century organizational structures. I look at these are some of the challenges identified by this Johnson and others. Right. This Johnson is normally identified as the best guy for the strategic management subject. So, Johnson, Scholar and the Whittington, uh, their strategic management book is the world number one strategic management book, right. That is why you can see this name again and again, right. Uh, this guy has identified uh, three main challenges for 21st century organization structures. What are the challenges? Uh, the first one is uh, flexibility flexibility of organization design. Uh, very important sentence flexibility right flexibility of organizational design. We are aware that environment is changing rapidly. Therefore, there is environmental uncertainty. It is not practical to have a stable structure in this type of environment situations. We, sh we should be able to adjust our structure to match the changes in the environment. Therefore, one of the important factor you have to look at about this is the flexibility of the organizational design. Then the B, B is effective systems that the B factor, the creation and exploitation of knowledge require effective system to link the people who have knowledge with the application that need it. Now, we are talking about knowledge society, lot of new knowledge is there. Therefore, we should have effective system to link the people who have knowledge with the application that need it. So, to use the knowledge of the people, we should have a proper structure within the organization. Otherwise, we will not be able to capitalize the knowledge of these people. That is the second point, effective systems. Then the third one is globalizations. Whole world talk about globalization, whole world talk about global village concepts. There are no countries now, there are no country bound, uh, boundaries now, right. So, that is why we say global village, geographical barriers have been eliminated. These globalizations uh, have created lot of uh, opportunities. At the same time, it has uh, make more uh, complexities in communication and information systems. This globalization has uh, encouraged diversity of cultures, practices and approaches. You can see uh, American person uh, work with the Indian guy at Microsoft together two guys coming from two different cultures. Now, diversity of culture, right? you have to uh, promote uh, this diversified of culture uh, within the organized structure, that is another factor we have to consider. Then, we look at the organizational configurations, how the structure of the Nirmana Karana Pulwanda Kina Karana Gattu Tehema. Uh, Johnson and others highlight about three elements that should be part of the organizational configurations. What are the three elements? One is structure, uh, that is the traditional organized structure we are talking about, that relationship. For example, what are the divisions we have? What are the unit within the divisions? Then, uh, how uh, the reporting uh, should be done to different persons, what are the relation be among them, that is structure, right, traditional structure, organized structure. For example, uh, by drawing organizational chart, we can see the traditional organized structure, that is one element. The second one is processes, 
normally uh, processors drive and support people. They define how strategies are made and controlled and how the organization people interact and implement strategy. For example, within the organization there may be a lot of processors. For example, purchasing process, recruiting process, selling process, accounting uh, recording process. That is another important element you have to consider when you are defining the organization configurations. Then the third one is uh, relationships. Relationship. Relationship are the connection between people within the organization and between those inside it and those on the outside. Uh, you can see lot of relationship exit. Some of them are formal relationship, some of them are informal relationship. Those cannot be found from the normal structure. Then if you look at the source, some of them uh, power can be found within the organization. Some relationship can be found uh, between uh, organization and the external environment. So, you have to consider those relationships also when you are designing the uh, organization structure. Those are three concerns, structure, processes and the relationships. Now, we will look at about organization structure. You know what is organization structure? So, if I draw a structure for you, traditional structure known to you. Uh, look at uh, some of the structure you have seen. So, you can see uh, board of directors at the top, they may have been appointed by the shareholders. Then you can see a CEO, chief executive officer, right, who is uh, normally acting as the head of the day to day operation of the organizations. Then you can see functional head, uh, here I have taken uh, four different functions, production, marketing, HR and finance. Under them you can see some of the low level managers, for example, under the production manager you can see production supervisors like A and B, marketing manager, marketing executive officer A, B, HR executive officer A, X, Y, finance manager under the finance manager, finance executive officers. Then under them you can see uh, our normal uh, other operational level employees. This is uh, the structure you have seen, no? right. Uh, what uh, reveal about uh, this formal structure? Uh, if you look at about the formal structure, that uh, discourse uh, about few things. One is it shows who is responsible for what. Uh, for example, if you look at the structure here, uh, one I have drawn, right? Uh, for example, production manager is responsible on the production function. Finance manager is responsible for the financial functions. Then it show who communicate with whom both in procedural factors and to great extent in less formal way. For example, finance manager want to report to the uh, CEO, right? That is one communication link with him. Then there are some other uh, fear employees like marketing manager, HR manager. Then uh, there are some subordinate under the finance manager like finance executives. So, you tell who communicate with whom, right? Then uh, another point is the, the upper level of the structure reveal the skill the organization values and by extend the role of knowledge and skill within 
it is normally uh, if you look at about the structure right uh, at the top you can see uh, uh, some of the people uh, right like head of uh, marketing head of finance right they ha uh, should have a particular knowledge on a particular area right now uh, since uh, to implement the proposed strategy right we should have a, a proper structure right we should have understanding about the different structural alternatives we can have in practice at man me pahadili den api anuragatta strategy prayako kriyatmaka karana yaddi apita thiyenona structure eka mokadda kiyana eka thirney karanna one e sandaha දැනුම ලබා ගන්න අපි මොකද කරන්න ඕනේ අපි ඉගෙන ගන්න ඕනේ මොනවද අපිට ව්‍යාපාර ලෝකේ දකින්න පුළුවන් විවිධ සංවිධාන ව්‍යුහයන් මොනවද කියන එක පිළිබඳව අපිට අවබෝධයක් තියෙන්න ඕනේ ඒ නිසා ඔයගොල්ලන්ගේ සිලබස් එක ඔයගොල්ලන්ට කියලා තියෙනවා ඉගෙන ගන්න කියලා එවැනි ව්‍යුහයන් වර්ග හතක් right so if you look at different type of organized structure Johnson and others review seven basic self-contained structural types. I'm sure you have learned these uh, some of them in your early studies. So, what are the different type of structural model uh, uh, which have been identified by Johnson and others? Functional, multi-divisional, holding company, matrix, transnational, team, then project. Right. So, seven structures have been identified. Fight. Functional, multi-divisional, holding company, matrix, transnational, theme and project. So, we want to discuss about the structure in details. So, first of all, we will discuss about the functional structure. So, in a functional organized structure, department are defined by their functions, that is the work that they do. So, internally we arrange the activities uh, based on the task they perform. For example, people who perform uh, marketing related activities are grouped into a marketing department. People who perform production related activities are grouped into a separate department called production department. Uh, people uh, like uh, bookkeepers, uh, cashiers, uh, account assistant. They perform finance related activities and we they uh, then we uh, group them into finance department. Then uh, there are some people who recruit uh, people, then uh, preparation of salaries work are done by some people, right. So, uh, people who connect with uh, HR matters are grouped together and uh, we form the HR department. This is the most uh, easiest way of uh, arranging activity within the organization and uh, more common one we can see in the business environment. Right. Then uh, the next one is uh, multi-divisional and holding company structures. Multi-divisional and holding company structures. Now, if you look at about this one, uh, the multidivisional structure divide the organization into semi autonomous division that may be differentiated by territory, product or market. Now, here I look at the definition very carefully multidivisional structure divide the organization into semi autonomous divisions. एग्जाम्पल की Organization head office is there. Organization head office. In there, you can find division A, B, and C. Right? Then uh, within the division, we arrange the other activities. So within division, you can find the 
functional areas. Holding company also similar right uh, it also use division form look at the holding company structure. Holding company structure is an extreme form in with the division of separate legal entities. Here the difference is each uh, division is signed by a separate legal entity right uh, compared with the uh, early example we discussed. Earlier one you have division but they are not separate legal entities but in holding company structure the division you have identified those are separate companies we have identified those are separate legal entities in front of the law right. Uh, look at that holding company structure given holding company subsidiary A, B, C right, subsidiary A, B and C uh, look at that one we have three subsidiaries then what you can do within the parent or oh, under the parent you can identify that three subsidiary companies under subsidiary A there may be some other subsidiary that also can be arranged within them I think it is clear for you. Matrix structure what is matrix structure single name gina gatta langhe matak gati ekali gina gatta niyasa sangdhani uhe gile ka what is matrix structure right. So, in a matrix structure right uh, it provides for the formalization of management control between different functions while at the same time maintaining functional departmentalizations. So, it try to maintain the functional departmentalization right uh, at the same time it provide uh, more formalization of the management control between different functions right. It can be a mixture of functional product and territorial organizations. So, we will uh, look at about this matrix structure uh, in detail little bit. You know uh, how uh, traditionally organized structure is uh, created based on the functional uh, specialty. For example, we'll say like this: CEO. So you will say here production manager, char manager. finance manager, then marketing manager, say under him will say production supervisor, say char executive officer, finance executive officer, then marketing city officer, right if you look at about this uh, right uh, in this structure we have used uh, one of the golden principle in design of the structure that is unity of command principles. We have used unity of command principle when you are designing this structure unity of command anadhi me ekate ratan vidanadhi me ekate kiyana mulu dharma you may remember the things you have learned unity of command so according to this principle uh, every employee should have one boss so they should avoid dual authority that mean two bosses should not be there for one particular employee. For an example, if you look at about this uh, structure, the production manager will be given instruction through CEO, he is having one boss, the production supervisor will be given instruction through production manager, one boss, unity of command principle 
are comply here. In a metric structure, this unity of command principle is violated. Dual authority principle is used. For an example, uh, there may be a product X manager. Here, then this four employee may be reporting to product X manager also. Right, if you look at about this structure now, it applies dual authority. If you look at about this production supervisor here, he will be given instruction to from two managers. Production manager will give instruction at the same time production uh, X manager will also give instruction to production supervisor. If you look at HRX officer, product X manager will give instruction to HRX officer at the same time HR manager also give instructions. So, this is one of the structure you can get more work from the employees, but there are some uh, weaknesses also associated with this particular structure. Right, then uh, the next structure is uh, task national structure, task national structure. So, in this structure, our focus is to conduct business in global business place. This is more relevant with the multinational organizations. While you are doing business in global business place, here we try to adjust ourselves to the local requirement also. You are a multinational company while you are doing business in different countries, you adjust, you are trying to adjust to the local requirement also. That is why it is a transnational structure. But it is not easy task to do. It is very difficult to adjust to the responsibility to the local conditions. It need uh, good coordinations. So, here globalization uh, level is high at the same time extent of local adaptation also very high. If you look at some of the multinational operate in Sri Lanka you can find see, you can find this. For example, uh, uh, some of the multinational name like Unilever. So, what they have done is they have adjusted to the Sri Lankan market. So, based on uh, Sri Lankan requirement actually they have uh, introduced some product even. Uh, for example, I, like the, I saw some of these Ayurvedic nature uh, right uh, products, they have adapted that Ayurvedic medicines uh, right those things also into their products and uh, herbal one, uh, herbal one and they try to offer to Sri Lankan market, they try to match the Sri Lankan requirement right, that is transnational structure. Uh, if you look at about the this transnational structure, Johnson and others note that uh, transnational structure has three specific operational characteristics. So, what are the three specific operational characteristics of transnational structure? We will look at about that also. The first one is uh, National units are independent operating entities, but also provide capabilities such as research and development that are utilized by the rest of the organization. Now, each country you have separate unit, right? they are independent operating entities, each country. Uh, in each country separate unit, they have the research and development capability. Within their country, they conduct research and try to identify the customer requirement and try to match those requirement. That is one of the requirements. Then the B, 
such shared capabilities allow national unit to achieve global or at least regional economic of scales. The shared capabilities right, help at the corporate level to achieve economic of scales. For example, these uh, unit share information with other unit in the global that ultimately will help you them to achieve economic of scales. The global corporate parent net value by establishing the basic role of each national unit and then supporting the system relationship and culture that enable them to work together as an effective network. Parent is at the top now. So, parents try to establish a good relation among these unit and they give uh, parent give the required support to this each individual unit and try to develop a good relationship among this uh, unit and uh, have a bonding culture among unit also that the fair and jobs actually. Right. Then uh, we look at about the team based structure. Now, it is clear for you. Right. So, at the beginning we identify seven uh, type of structures now. We are discussing that. So, we discuss functional, multidivisional, holding company, matrix, transnational. Now, I am moving to the team structure, team based structure. What is team based structure? A team based structure extend the matrix structures use of both vertical functional link and horizontal activity base once by utilizing cross functional teams. This extend the matrix structure. Uh, this also use that both vertical functional link and the horizontal activity base one. The matrix structure, vertical reporting and the horizontal reporting both were there, no? Right? This one also use the both. Right? Activity base one by utilizing cross functional team. Uh, here we establish some cross functional teams. Right? For example, one from uh, HR, one from finance, one from uh, marketing, uh, we get people and uh, then uh, construct some cost functional teams. Then uh, the business processes are often used as basis of organization with each team being responsible for the processes related to an aspect of the business. Uh, each team has given a responsibility on uh, different area. For example, I know banks uh, in some banks uh, they have uh, this team based structures. So, what they have done is they have appoint team uh, from different uh, functional areas. For example, uh, we will say loan there are some team members they have to work together right and they have to achieve the target. Then credit card another team they have to work together and achieve the targets. Right, then uh, the last one, right, the project one is the last one, that is the seventh one, that is project based structure, the project based structure. What is project based structure? Here we talk about uh, the structure which carry project, they also have a similar structure to the team. But here there is a important difference, right? The project have a finite life, not indefinite life. When the project time period is over, then that uh, temporary arrangement is also coming to end. The project uh, structure is also having a similar structure to the matrix. But here the difference is uh, in the project structure, normally you have a temporary arrangement, right? Finite life. It is a project time period, did, for example, it is a two year period. After that two year period, uh, that uh, temporary structure is coming to end. Then you may again uh, create another uh, project based team, but the, in that scenario the member will be difference. So, normally a project based structure it is important to have a clear project uh, definitions. So, later we will discuss uh, about project management under this operation management in details. right? Uh, for example, uh, 
so one of the common project uh, taking place in the organization is IT based uh, projects uh, for example, implementation of ERP project. So, normally you should have clear defined uh, project definitions right. Then uh, you have to uh, time time review the work of the project right. Uh, this is normally extend the uh, metric uh, uh, approach by using cross functional teams. Different between project uh, and uh, other team structure is uh, project is coming to end right, uh, but uh, normally uh, uh, metric structure is a uh, short of a permanent arrangement not a temporary arrangement right. With that we can complete project based structure also. Then under the topic number 5, uh, we are going to look at about uh, some of the factors to be considered when we are choosing a structure. Then Johnson and others uh, summarize the 7 basic type in a table. They emphasize that no single model of organization is suitable for all purposes. You see there is no single uh, model which can be used for every occasion. It will differ from uh, one purpose to another. So, manager must take, make choices as to which challenges they regard as most pressing. Uh, look at uh, uh, here you can identify the 7 structures we have learned. Look at the functional structure. Now, uh, what about that control wise fantastic no. The best control level can be exercised under the functional structure. Uh, if you are working in uh, organization where functional structure is applied, you may remember how the controls uh, happening in there, right. For example, even you cannot uh, write to a, uh, another uh, right superior in another department, no. For example, if you are account executive, you cannot write direct to the head of production, no. You have to write through the finance manager, no. That the control you have, uh, for example, right. But what about the change? a uh, very right low ability on change because uh, these are uh, right uh, permanent uh, nature relationships right uh, lot of uh, strong relationships are there very difficult to make changes because of those relationships knowledge average globalization very low adjustability to the globalization is very low But if you look at about the uh, structure like holding matrix, they are really good on uh, change change perspective, transnational also really good in change perspective, project also good. Knowledge wise matrix transnational teams are really good. Globalization part matrix and transnationals are really good. So, it show uh, different uh, right, uh, uh, aspect in uh, different type of organization structures. So, we will continue with uh, this choosing structure. When I choose this structure is Gould, uh, right, uh, Gould and Campbell proposed 9 tests that may be used to assess proposed structures. So, these two gentlemen nine find 9 tests. I am sure that you will learn this one at uh, uh, your first level, right. Uh, in the previous syllabus at the Excel level you may have learned this one. Right, the management uh, these 9 tests are there, right. So, uh, this Gould and Campbell propose 9 tests that may be used to assess proposed structures, right. Uh, the first 4 relate to the organization objectives and the restraint under which it operate, right. What are the 4 related with these objectives? We will look at about that one. One is market advantage. So, that is one of the objective of uh, having a proper structure no, you have to ensure that uh, your structure deliver the required market advantage, where processes must be closely coordinated in order to achieve market advantage. So, internal processes should be closely coordinated to get market advantage. Then parenting advantage, I should uh, help uh, the role of the parent uh, played by the corporate center is relevant to the group of a company. So, if you are selecting a, a structure for a 
right a group of a company. So, individual unit structure should support to the parent job. Then see people test. The structure must be suited to the skills and experience of the people that have to function within it. For example, skill professional used to a team working approach might be prostrated by a move to a functional hierarchy. So, you should have a, a structure that uh, help to use the skills and experience of the people in the uh, organizations. Uh, for example, uh, right, uh, normally for a skill professional, functional hierarchy is not the ideal one. They can't use their skills, no. But team working approach may be the ideal. If you ask team working uh, structure people to move to a functional hierarchy one, then they may not uh, happy with that, no, right. Then feasibility test, this test sweep up all the constraints such as those imposed by low stakeholder opinion and resource availability. Whatever the structure you select, check whether it is practicable uh, to implement, right. For example, uh, compliance to the laws, right. Then uh, I am going to discuss some sub principle associated with the organized structure that is centralization and the decentralizations. So, what is the meaning of these two? Centralization versus decentralizations. A relatively uh, simple quality of an organized structure is whether it is centralized or decentralized. What is centralizations? Centralization means control is retained at the center of an organization. Uh, control is retained at the center for example, at head office level. Centralization facilitate control and standardizations uh, that give more control and try to uh, apply standardization throughout the organizations. Decentralization relies talent and local knowledge. Right. I will uh, illustrate this principle uh, further to you. Centralization was decentralizations. The centralization and decentralization depend on uh, authority, depend on authority, whether delegation of authority is done or not. delegation of authority is uh, applied or not. If you have applied the delegation of authority, yes, then the model is then decentralizations. If you have not applied the authority to the lowest levels, that is called centralizations. That means, uh, uh, people uh, uh, for example, managers within the organization keep the authority with them. Sometimes you may have experienced this scenario. Right. Uh, say for example, uh, suppose this is head office, suppose this is branch. So, if uh, branch people want to get the approval for each payment from the head office, approval from head office for each payment. So, what do you think? This is centralization principles. So, authority is vested with the head office, they have not delegated to the branch, right. Decentralization means, for example, say you ask branch people, uh, you can. Uh, spend up to 10,000 rupees. You delegate the authority to the branch people, right. This is decentralization. Head of is not keeping all the authority 
and assign uh, some of their authority to the branch people. I think it is uh, clear for you. Then we will move to the next topic, topic number 6, modern development in organization structure. Right. Under that actually, uh, first of all, we will look at about this boundary uh, level organizations, right. Boundary level organization first uh, will be covered. Then we look at a whole organized structure, then model organized structure, then uh, look at about different uh, alliances, network organizations, virtual organization, right, like that. Right. One of the modern development in organized structure is boundless organizations. What is boundless organizational structure? That is 6.1 actually, right? Boundless organization, that is 6.1. Boundaryless organization are those uh, which have structured the operation to allow for collaboration with external parties. Boundaryless organization are those which have structured their operation to allow for collaboration with external parties. Boundaryless. So, these organizations have been structures uh, to have operations. Uh, uh, with different parties externally. This type of structure uh, actually help to building relation with suppliers, competitors and customers right? and uh, it will uh, increase the operational flexibility to respond to change. Actually, there are the various type of boundaryless organizations. Right? We are trying to discuss this uh, different type of boundaryless organization in the remaining part. Holo, modular, virtual and network organized structure. These are examples of boundless organizations. Boundless mean more flexible type of structures which allow collaboration with external parties. There are different type of example of boundless organization. Holo, modular, virtual, network, then strategic alliance also consider as a boundless organization. What are the example of strategic alliances, joint ventures, franchising and licensing. Right. Then uh, we look at about each uh, boundless organized structure in details. Uh, so, first of all under 6.2, look at about whole organization structure. Whole organized structure, what is whole organized structure? Here outsourcing is central. Here we use outsourcing as a strategy. Here, what type of activity we are going to outsource? We are going to outsource non-co-processors of the organization, not the co-activities. We are trying to outsource uh, uh, non-critical activities of the organization. Uh, what are the example? Like human relations, uh, like HR, uh, then uh, payroll, logistics, right? We outsource them to a third party specialist vendors. When you outsource this non co processors activity that will uh, enable organization to concentrate on its co value adding activities. Right. So, that will help to get a competitive advantage. Uh, very common uh, these days no? you can see third party may be doing your uh, payroll. Uh, uh, then you can see uh, third party may acting as recruiting agency for the organizations. Right? Then janitor real works, uh, even IT, those things are outsourced to third parties. Right? It is clear for you what is holo organized structure. Then the next boundaryless organized structure is modular organization structure. What is modular organization structure? A modular organization structure involved and organizing outsourcing. This is in here also outsourcing. 
a hollow also outsourcing, he also outsourcing. Some part of his production to specialist providers. Now, the difference between hollow and modular is under the modular we outsource some part of the production to specialist providers. Under the hollow we outsource non critical activities, but here we also something related to the production works. Then the core company will then assemble the outsource component in house to produce a final products. Then what co company will do is they will assemble the outsource component in house to produce a final products. Or a third party will then not be put put Kali Nishpadhne karanga it was a Kali tika aragana be final product tika hadhane ka siddha karano. This is very common in high tech industries such as aircraft manufacture. Then alliances, so what are the different type of alliances available, right. Various form of uh, complex organic result from the pressure to pool resources including partnership, partnership is one of the example of alliances, right. Then uh, alliances uh, like franchises, joint ventures, right. Uh, so, franchises you know that for example, uh, in Sri Lanka Abans uh, has taken the franchise of McDonald's, joint ventures, joint venture mean uh, one company put money uh, right uh, sorry uh, few company put money and uh, start a new company, if I illustrate that uh, to you joint venture. See for example, uh, we'll say there are two uh, independent company called A and B. Right. So they put money. A put money, B put money, and then they right uh, form A B joint venture. Right. See fifty percent investment here, fifty percent investment. Right. Now we can see three entities called A, B, and A, B. Right. Or we'll call this one as C. Then it's clear, no? Now we have three entities, three independent entities C. But the ownership of the C is divided among the A and B. They have put the capital. That is joint venture. Franchise and joint venture consortia. That is short term arrangement, not a long term arrangement for a particular work. For example, uh, constructing a terminal, uh, we will say Sri Lanka government and Chinese government may uh, right, uh, uh, come to a consortia arrangement to construct a terminal, right. Uh, and the unintegrated structure result from the takeovers and mergers, takeovers, mergers also result in alliances. Structures such as franchises and joint venture inevitably depend on the management of relationships. Uh, definitely franchise very important to have good relation with the foreign partner, uh, joint venture also uh, you should have good relationship otherwise uh, uh, there will be a lot of problems no. Through the legal form can vary from loose cooperation or more or less market term to join ownership, legal ownership may be change. Right, then uh, we we'll look at about what is network organization also, network organizations. So, Johnson and others note that the idea of network structure is applied both within and between organization. Network organization can be found within and between organization also. Within the organization term is used to describe the structure of informal relationship that exists in the most organization alongside the formal structure. Informal relations exceed, uh, example for network organization. Uh, for example, within your, your organization you may have found lot of friends who uh, are not in the same uh, unit no. So, if you are connected with different people uh, in different division, so that is a network type of organization structure. So, 
such one is good for uh, uh, innovative respond to change in circumstances. Then if you look at about this uh, external part, the network approach is also visible in the growing field of outsourcing and strategic method. So, when you apply outsourcing that also result in network organizations. So, what you can do is you can develop a complete relationship with the right outsource party. So, for example, uh, we'll say you get the service of gender service from a third party, then your organization and that third party organization is also connected network organization you work as a network basis I think it is clear for you. Network organization can be right uh, network structure can be found both within and between organization within for example, informal relationship between for example, when you have applied the outsourcing. So, that may result in network organization structure. Then virtual organizations, uh, what is virtual organizations? Uh, so, virtual mean his key nikane, shunya ki nikane. So, there are no physical settings, right. So, if you look at the virtual organization definitions, uh, look at the definitions. Uh, a virtual organization is a temporary or permanent collection of geographical dispersed individuals, group organization unit which may or may not belong to the same organization or entire organization that depend on electronic linking in order to complete the production process. I uh, hear what happened uh, geography disperse uh, individual group organ unit connect each other through a electronic link right. So, for example, traveling organizations I have seen some traveling companies uh, uh, work as virtual organization there are some guys work from homes and uh, right they do the booking for the clients as an example virtual organizations. Uh, now, most of the uh, model physical model are trying to convert into virtual organizations no? right. Even we will say online uh, tuition provider what do you think there is a example for virtual organization no? they do not have uh, right physical place they, they can be found only in the internet now right. Then we look at about the meaning of outsourcing uh, offshoring uh, and chat servicing also first of all uh, we look at about the meaning of uh, outsourcing I think no need to uh, explain uh, you know what is outsourcing now. So, under the outsourcing what happened some of the processes of the organization now outsource to a third party. So, here some of the internal business function is given to a third party. Normally, uh, organization are reluctant to outsource the critical activities and normally uh, it is appropriate to outsource the non-critical activities right. What are the example uh, uh, like uh, janitorial work, security work right those are example for non-critical activities. Then what is offshoring? Ah, offshoring is a form of outsourcing that involves an external entity based in a different country providing an organ with a particular product or process which had previously been provided in house. So, here you outsource some of the work of the organization to a party who is staying in a foreign country right. For example, uh, we will say uh, the raw material right uh, you also that part to a th uh, right foreign party or some of the component of the organization is produced in a foreign country organizations right. If the difference is uh, the country difference you also the function to a uh, third party uh, service provider staying in a foreign country this is very common with uh, product components right. The shared servicing uh, in some Sri Lankan organization also I have seen they use this shared servicing right. What is this shared servicing? Shared service centers consolidate the transaction processing activities of many operations within a company. These are very common with the group of companies right. The group of a company you can find so many uh, independent unit within the independent unit you can see so many processors 
for example accounting function may be taking place in individual uh, unit separately under the shared servicing what happen at a central point uh, you do that work for each company that help to maximize the resource utilizations one of the shared servicing you use is the accounting functions for this each individual unit accounting function is done in a central locations now it is one of the example right shared service centers consolidate the transaction processing activities of many operations within a company shared service centers aim to achieve significant cost reduction while improving service level through the use of standardized technology and process here the main objective is to reduce the cost so many large owner have moved to centralize the it support functions common another example is it support functions one common support function is there every company can call them and get the required support account is another example i am sure that sometime you may we also work in the shared service center in a large group uh, in the accounting department right so it is common now for one it help desk to serve the entire organization as opposed to individual division or department having their own designated it supports so with that uh, we can complete different type of structures a uh, new modern structures available then uh, we can move to the next uh, topic relationship between strategy and structure relationship between strategy and structure so at the beginning also i explained the relationship between strategy and structure i say that uh, there are two uh, contrasting view point also one is uh, some people say strategy should follow structure that mean uh, when you are selecting the strategy uh, to match the structure you have to select the strategy then the other view point is structure follow the strategy that means structure should be changed to match the requirement of the strategy two contrasting view point is there so we look at about what is uh, uh, in the not also look at the first point uh, there has been debate as to which of the strategy and structure is the independent variable and which the dependent there's a debate uh, what is the dependent variable what is independent variable for example if you say strategy follow structure strategy follow structure in that scenario structure is the independent variable strategy is the dependent variable because strategy has to be adjusted to the structure right there is debate on this right chandra concluded that structure was determined by strategy uh, chandra say that uh, structure normally de was determined by the strategy right according to the strategy you define the structure in other word but it has been suggested that once a large organization has settled into a particular structural form the hierarchical company and cultural factors associated with that form will predispose it toward a particular strategy stand but if you have a large organization in that scenario very difficult to, to change the structure in that scenario strategy should match with the structural requirement right so with that uh, we can complete that relationship part also between strategy and the structure then uh, we can move to a very important uh, topic right uh, please read this part uh, very careful in your study text not for the exam purpose but for your knowledge purpose very important topic management in a dynamic business environment and threat of strategic drift right so management in a dynamic business environment dynamic mean changing business environment and threat of strategic drift right so so we'll go through uh, this so 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 dynamic business strategies help a business to respond quickly to environmental changes so if you have a dynamic strategies you adjust your strategy based on the uh, requirement so that will help you to meet the changes in the environment very easily in a constantly changing business environment the ability to modify it implement new strategy quickly is important if the environment is changing rapidly it's very important to have a uh, ability to change your strategy accordingly if you can't change the strategy quickly then uh, you will be too late to catch the market uh, dynamic business strategies help to ensure that a business can respond appropriate to changes that may represent both potential opportunities and new threat to its operations if you have a dynamic changing strategy right uh, then that will help you to 
uh, respond appropriate changes in the environment. So, that will help you to capitalize the opportunities at the same time to face the threat in the environment. So, normally uh, if you want to uh, have a dynamic uh, strategy, you have to uh, do few things within the organization. What are the few things you have to do with do the organizations? So, one is uh, organization should watch the competitors, very important one. You have to watch your competitors very carefully. You have to check what competitors are doing. So, what are the new things they have done in the market? Are there any new products? Are there any uh, innovations they have done? You have to carefully monitor the behavior of them. Right? Accordingly, right, you have to adjust your strategy. For example, if they have done something new, you also should uh, right, uh, do similar steps. Then another one is, uh, uh, another point is plan flexibly. Right? You should not have strategic plan, your plan should be dynamic one. It is not practical to have 10 year strategic plan and go along with that. When the market change, what you have to do is, uh, you have to adjust your plan. Time time you have to review your plan and accordingly you have to make the adjustment. That is why it is very important to monitor the plan uh, on continuous basis and do the required adjustment. Then uh, seek information, right? always good intelligence is essential for good decisions. So, you have to uh, get new knowledge uh, what is happening in the marketplace, then those uh, new knowledge should be adjusted, uh, should be uh, adapted uh, when you are designing your strategy. Right. It is very important principle strategic drift. Uh, so, we will look at about what is strategic drift also, very important principle. Right. Uh, look at this strategic drift. Strategy drift is when a company respond too slowly to changes in, in its external environment. Avasya tattira vada aduing, avasya veldapoli innona siddharanta vada aduing kriyatmakantanta strategy drift ka kila kiyanni. Right. This happen normally when you are responding very too slowly to changes in an external environment. So, normally this can happen to any organization at any time. Uh, if you look at the history, you can find lot of companies who have failed. Uh, for example, companies like Nokia, Kodak, those are fantastic example. They were market leaders, but uh, ultimately they fail uh, in the industry. Then uh, flux, uh, what is this flux? Uh, in extreme circumstances, strategic drift may lead on to a state of flux as the company suddenly discovers it is in a trouble. Right? It's a serious scenario. Flux is characteristic by panic and confusions. Then industry industry That may create lot of panic and confusions. So Right, uh, you are not going to take uh, proper decision, you are going to take piecemeal decisions uh, without looking at the long term view. Uh, something happened at this stage that post management to focus on the problem ahead. Uh, then for example, one of their customer leave from them, then new uh, entrants uh, uh, right, came into the market, right. So, that try to capture your customers, right. Then uh, there is a change in the legislations that uh, create threat for your business survival, right. So, little in the way of progress is possible at this stage, but in this stage uh, very difficult to get the progress. <coughs> if you allow to continue this flux uh, situations, what will happen? That will uh, result in the demise of the organization. Right, flux demise of the organizations. So, what you have to do? In this type of scenario, you have to go for transformational change, right? Uh, transformational change. What is transformational change? If you are in a flux situation, uh, the best option is to go for a transformational change. This is little bit risky. You look at what is transformational uh, change. Open the only way for an organization to deal with being in a state of flux is to attempt transformational change in a belated attempt to catch up with its competitors. You try to catch up uh, the competitors 
through a significant change in simple terms. It's a very risky approach involving changes of several front at the same time. We are trying to change so many aspects in the organization simultaneously. Not a small incremental change. A major change has been implemented by right changing main areas in the organizations. So, leading to managers being spread to thinky and not able to give sufficient attention to all those aspects of the business that need it. Sometime when you are trying to change everything, uh, enough attention may not be given for certain areas. All too often this setup will be unsuccessful and the organization will fail. Koma regala try karna allah na loku changes kal hai bhai make karna make make hadha na right ussa hai samahar boho vedavad magad vedavad vedavad ni asar tak veno loku jampe ka gana hadha ni e jampe ka lacing gana bhai right inisa boho vedavad make asar tak veno I think if you look at about this one I think it will be clear for you look at the strategic grip now environment change, uh, look at the uh, amount of uh, uh, to change of the organization, there is a gap under the strategic grip, right. So uh, then uh, plugs what happened that gap broaden and this transformation change or demise what we are trying to do, transformational change that means uh, you try to catch that one, that is one option. You go uh, oh, otherwise what can happen? Demise also can take place. Demise means the end. I can go toward the bottom line. Your attempt uh, is unsuccessful one. I think with that I think uh, we can complete this chapter. I hope you understood the things. So, there are lot of material available. So, go to your tubes, uh, just watch uh, thousands of videos are available for exam strategy drifts. All right, uh, you can watch. Uh, and uh, read a uh, lot of materials are available and try to get the best understanding of the concepts.